So you're evolving out of this identity for 10 years. You saw yourself as a BMX racer, and now you're moving into an identity of somebody who is a real estate investor, who's more focused on collaborations and networking and friendships. What do you do perhaps on a daily or weekly basis to ensure that you are propelling yourself towards the identity that you want to have now and not reverting back to the identity that you held previously? That's a really, really good question. It's something that pertains to these days right now. And one of the biggest things is exactly what you just said, remembering that you are and cannot do this alone. Hey there, and welcome to the All In Mindset podcast. This podcast is all about exploring the power of mindset and how it can help you achieve your goals, overcome obstacles, and live a more fulfilling life. We'll be talking about everything from goal setting and time management to mindset and personal growth while mixing in our experiences, good and bad, to help you learn. Whether you're just starting out on your journey of self-improvement or you're looking for some new strategies to take your life to the next level, this podcast is for you. Welcome everyone to the All In Mindset podcast where we strive to improve your life and your mindset one podcast at a time. Greg and I have a very unique and interesting guest for y'all on today's episode. Peter Eberhardt was a BMX racer beginning at the age of 12. By the time he was 19, he had achieved multiple district and state championships, but he had his eyes set on the national circuit. But he didn't have the national caliber tracks to train on in his hometown in Northern California. He's laughing at me because I know nothing about BMX biking here. <laughs> so what he did, though, was he spent all of his money that he had and he moved down to San Diego where he began training at the Olympic Training Center. And while he was training in San Diego, he decided that he needed to buy a house in order to earn the money and the time freedom that he needed to race at the level that he desired to be at. So he actually drove an Uber for six months. He bought his first condo at the age of 21. And a year after getting ranked nationally in BMX racing, he decided to go all in on real estate. So Peter now owns several properties, including multiple unit complexes, and he's looking forward to his future by increasing his network opportunities, being involved in masterminds, which is timely here because Greg and I were just talking about masterminds this week. And he's reframed his mindset regarding business partners and joint ventures. So I personally can't wait to hear more about Peter's story. So let's get this episode started. Peter, welcome to the All In Mindset podcast. Man, Justin and Greg, thanks for having me. That was that was a hell of an intro. So <laughs> I wasn't expecting such a such a detailed and long winded thing. And yeah, it made me chuckle a little bit to hear someone else you know, say what you were saying. So thanks for having me guys. I'm really stoked to be here. Yeah. Peter, is there, is there anything that I did not mention in your bio there that you would like to share with our listeners? Well, it, it hit a lot on the topics at hand, I think, as far as getting through certain struggles and challenges that you go through when you're trying to achieve a certain goal. And a lot of it was, of course, there was a lot of other little things here and there and struggles that I went through along the way, but no, you were all encompassing of it. And, you know, that's just been my journey of how I got here to San Diego and now where I'm at. And looking back on it, it's still kind of a little bit surreal that I'm here coming from where I came from. But, you know, it's just it's just been an it's just been an awesome ride. And I'm just really learning how to enjoy the process. Yeah, I think that's like reading over your bio that you sent to me. That's something that kind of stood out to me is I think your story is really impressive. Because at the age of 21, you bought your first complex. And I'm thinking, I always do this because I'm 40 years old now and I squandered my 20s, like completely wasted them. And so anytime I meet somebody who's so ambitious and in my mind, successful at what I would consider a young age, I'm just in awe because I'm like, man, if I could go back and buy my first property at the age of 21, where would I be today? right? Like what got you besides just the necessity to 
earn more money so you could do what at at that time what you thought you wanted to do most like what got you to that place was like yeah i'm 21 years old i can buy a complex that's fine <laughs> you know it, it was all common sense at mm -hmm. the time for me and this goes back for, for as long as i can remember you know getting my first job moving to san diego everything that my support system cheered me on for to me it was just common sense okay I really want to get to where I want to be in racing. Well, I'm not going to do it here with the resources I have. So I need to go somewhere where I can do that. And it wasn't a second thought. It was very easy. And I think a lot of what contributed to that was I wasn't very close with my intermediate family. I didn't put a lot, if any, emphasis on friendships and relationships. And so people would always, for example, moving to San Diego was like, wow, that's so courageous of you, you know, congratulations. Like it'd be very hard for me to do something like that. And I never understood that. Mm. You know, I never understood why I wanted to do something and that's what I needed to do to do it. So I went and did it. Yeah. So I never understood, you know, I said, thank you and whatever, but to me, it wasn't a big deal. And hearing what you're saying, I think us as humans, we're all, all you know, the saying grass is always greener on the other side and we're always wishing or wanting, you know, we, we look at other people as successful where now that I'm at this point in my life, call it my next chapter, and I've hung up the bike for now, I see people that have healthy relationships and friendships as successful. Mm -hmm. And that put an emphasis on those friendships and things like that. So coming to San Diego, same thing with buying a condo. I was in a little bit more of an expensive place to live. And I was now competing on the national circuit, which is much more expensive than yeah. on the state circuit. And money was very tight. I remember moving down to San Diego and already living above my, living above my means. And the only way I could get by was opening up an uh, Amazon store credit line and buying credit uh, gift cards for Whole Foods and Subway, because those oh, were God. the only two <laughs> gift cards that were available on Amazon. <laughs> and of course, as you know, Whole Foods is not cheap. Nope. So with that being said, I thought I was living like a king, but I didn't care because I was here racing. And yeah. so, you know, bills came up, credit came up, you know, money started to dry up. And I'm like, man, what do I need to do? Because to me, it just did not make sense why I loved racing so much. And in order to race, I had to work. And because I had to work, I couldn't race. So it was this constant cycle. And I'm like, man, this has got to stop. Like, it, it's just so unfair that life is how it is, where money is such a trivial thing, but it's such a necessity to function and operate. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know a thing about real estate investing. I just saw like, hey, my biggest expense is my living expense. Because you also have to keep in mind, well, when I lived up in Northern California, I did pay a little bit of rent, but this was my first time paying like full market rent. And so that was a big deal to me. And I was like, I'm literally throwing away this money. Mm -hmm. It just didn't make any sense to me. Again, back to the common sense thing. So I'm like, okay, cool. I need to buy a place and it's going to be a three bedroom and my two roommates are going to pay my mortgage so that I don't have to have a living expense. And that way I'll have more money to raise. To me, it just, it was perfect sense. Yeah. And at the time, you know, through the grapevine, I got hooked up with, you know, Lyft and Uber, which was a new thing at the time. This was back in 20, 2015, 2016. And it had, you know, it was still a developing industry. And I got hooked up with that. And at the time I started making double what I was making at my regular job in the bicycle industry. Yeah. And you know, as a 20 year old, I'm like, this is crazy. I'm right? rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, you know, I'm like, wow, like I'm making $30 an hour, mm -hmm. just driving my car. And I love driving. I mean, I just, I love cars, big car guy, big driving guy. So it was just the best of both worlds. And I got hooked. And so very quickly I saved up to buy a condo, but I was, so I was probably driving straight for six months. And during that six month time, the market had adjusted to where now three bedroom condo was like just out of my reach, mm -hmm. but I could get a two bedroom. And I was already so burnt out from driving for six months. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited to get back to racing. So I'm like, you know what? Fine. I, I'll, I'll just buy a two bedroom, have one roommate. And at the end of the day, I was paying the same. My part of my mortgage was the same as what rent I was paying before. So I kind of felt like a failure. But at least I was like, well, at least I'm not throwing all my money away. At least I'm paying down some principal. Moving forward, got back on the national circuit and 
again, it was, so it was just a, it was just a common sense thing to buy a property. I didn't, I didn't think twice about it. And later on in life, when I finished racing and started real estate investing, I found all these strategies and terms and things and mindsets that like I already had. I just didn't yeah. know that, you know, they had a name for it, like house hacking, for example. I was like, yeah. Oh, I, I already do that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I never looked into it any, any much of so, but yeah, it was, it was just all common sense really as to what, what brought me down here. I didn't, I didn't think much of it. Yeah. That's it's, it's too funny to me what you're explaining, especially what you just said at the end too, is like, I've been doing all of these things for all this, all this time. There's a, there's a name for it. The thing that stood out to me as you were talking there is from a young age, you're very focused on what it is that you wanted to accomplish and it was just common sense to you, which there's a name for that too. The people who are the most successful and driven, their pathways focus. So it's like, this is the goal that I want to get to. There's multiple pathways to get there. You just took the one that makes the most sense. It's just common sense to you. Um, I find that very fascinating because I guess I don't have common sense naturally because it took me a lot <laughs> longer to figure this out than it did you. Yeah. And one thing I was going to say too, that you mentioned in there, Peter, was uh, your support system. So one thing that I always talk about on this podcast is, you know, the the people in your life and the who in your life. But I'm guessing when you went into BMX, when you told people, hey, I'm going to be a BMX racer, um, I'm sure there were some naysayers of people of like, oh my God, you're crazy. Like, what are you doing? You're throwing your life away. Um, if there were those kind of people, like, how did you kind of, you know, take that in? Um, and what was your, just tell us a little bit more about, you know, your mindset and like personal development structure around that a little bit. And Greg, you're, you're really taking me back, back here. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't dug up the, a lot of this stuff in quite some time. I would say, I don't recall any naysayers per se. I mean, again, my circle was very, very small and that was 99% of people that were also in the sport. Mm. I wasn't super close with my family at the time. I was still at that age where I was doing my own thing and making my own identity which was completely separate of what my parents had sort of planned out for me. And they were the kind of folks that, you know, one of, one of the parents was not present a whole lot, always working. And the other parent was, you know, very religious, very strict and like, Hey, you're going to become a pastor. It's why my name's Peter. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to lead a church and follow along in the footsteps of everyone before you. And so from a very young age, uh, I felt a little bit of a outcast, so to speak. And I didn't know any of my intermediate family, you know, relatives, aunts, cousins, uncles, grandparents. I didn't, I wasn't around them at all. And I didn't really know them at all. So at the time, my, my family that I had was my BMX family and the people that would be there at the races that I felt understood by and heard by and seen by, you know, I did have some doubts. I recall, I mean, I was like, man, should I do this? Should I not? And in my heart, I knew that I was going to do it no matter what. And I had a few of the, you know, the people that I looked up to the most, just take me aside and say, Hey, yeah, you need to go. You know, there's nothing for you here. I mean, I, you are setting an example for my own kids that I hope that they will take off one day and follow their dreams. And, and so I went, um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't recall having naysayers per se, but again, like I mentioned before, there was a lot of people that afterwards and during the process were like, wow, Peter, you're so courageous. Like that's so awesome and amazing. And, and I was like, what are you talking about? Like <laughs> common sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where did then the shift start to occur for you? If you can actually pinpoint it, you said you hung your bike up now. So you're not pursuing the biking anymore right now. And you're kind of all in on the real estate where did that shift start to happen for you? It probably started to happen right after I got my national title. Mm. Uh, national national title is an overstatement. My national ranking. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, probably right after that where, you know, I kind of looked ahead. So over the whole, you know, I got very serious with it. I mentioned that I was living above my means. And what I meant by that is I was spending every last dollar I had on coaches, programs, uh, you know, training tools. I got very data analytical, very nerdy with it. Mm -hmm. And I took it, I, I took it way too seriously in retrospect, looking back, I took it 
way too seriously. I was the guy coming into the gym and setting up my power plates and my power wattages and my, you know, heart rate monitors and like all this stuff. And, mm -hmm. and it was, I, in, at the time I really enjoyed it, but what I didn't, what I wasn't aware of is I was just burning myself out mm -hmm. over time and getting that national ranking and looking ahead during that time period, you know, I had Olympic level coaches. I had mental coaches. I had my therapist. Like I was, I felt so confident. I remember this very vividly. I'd be sitting outside in, you know, just looking up at the moon or the stars. I love, love looking up at the stars at night and not thinking or hoping that I would get to where I want to be, but knowing without a doubt that I would get to where I want to be Yeah, and just being so sure of it. And so following that mentality with me down to San Diego, it was never a doubt in my mind. I just, it was just time that had to elapse in order for me to get to where I wanted to be. So getting my national ranking and finally, you know, after 10 years or however long it was of, of just getting this plate in my hand, you know, and I was like, Hey, like what's next. And right after that COVID hit. Mm. So I remember my, my very last national race, it was in Houston, Texas. And I think it was in March, I want to, or maybe late February, early March of 2020. And, you know, a few weeks later, COVID hit, none of us knew what was happening. You know, I told all my friends like, Hey, all these races are getting canceled. Well, I'll just take a little break and not train. Cause we're all thinking that it was going to last a few months, right? A few months turned into a year. And when I was out not training, cause again, that was my, that was my life seven mm -hmm. days a week, right? I wasn't really giving myself any breaks. You know, that's, I think kind of when that shift happened to where I realized just how much I did not like the sport anymore mm -hmm. and how much I had turned it into a job. Yeah. and how unhappy I was because of all that. And so the light bulb moment, well, I guess the light bulb moment of real estate came in was probably mid mid to late 2020. I was coming home from driving Uber late at night. It was probably about 10 o'clock. And I come into my complex and my neighbor has all of their stuff out on the front common area. And I was like, hey, what's going on, guys? Like, you know, what's going on? They're like, oh, we're moving to Oklahoma. And I'm like, right now it's yeah. 10 o'clock at night. They're like, yep. Husband's getting the U-Haul truck. Like we're packing up tonight and we're out of here by tomorrow morning. I'm like, okay, well shoot, let me help you. And so I was helping them pack their U-Haul truck. And in doing so I was, you know, kind of curious and I'm just like, Hey, like, you know, so what are you selling your place for? It's directly across <laughs> the way from mine, identical. And the number that they spit out at me, I think it was, I want to say that it was, 60 or 70,000 more than what I paid for my condo, like two years prior. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no way. Yeah. Right. Cause again, I'm like $5 to me is a lot of money. Yeah. You know, if I could say $5, that's, you know, that's, that's snacks at the snack bar for your, your part of your entry <laughs> fee to the race, you know? So I went and fact checked it. Sure enough. I'm like, Holy cow. And at that moment, I really realized the power of real estate. I'm like, there is something here. Like this is, this is something that I need to learn more about. And so it was, it wasn't really a moment that I hung up the bike, but it was that kind of transition between the fact of COVID was happening, which was inflating the real estate market, which was realizing my power in real estate. And I just went all in and I just didn't have any care to pick up the bike anymore. It was a, it was a little bit of an identity shift where mm -hmm. kind of like a breakup, you know, you're wondering, <laughs> and is this, is this right? You know, I've already come all this way, but the act of hanging up the bike was easy, uh, moving past that identity that I had given myself on the bike. And as a, as an athlete for so long and all the relationships and friendships, and I mean, it was your entire circle in your entire life. That was the most hardest part, which took me a few years. And I'm still kind of on the tail end of that. I'm learning how to make friendships. I'm learning how to have friendships prosper, like what value I need. You know, I, I have to call my friends and say, Hey, how are you doing? Yeah. You know, so, so I put in a lot of effort into that. Yeah. But, um, but that was, that was sort of the shift. It was kind of a, I'd probably say a gradual over, you know, nine to 12 months between COVID and everything else where I just didn't have any desire to train anymore. And I had let it go. And I accepted the fact that I was never going to become who I wanted to become in the sport. Mm. 
you're speaking my language now, um, talking about identity. I want to point this out too, because it makes me chuckle. You changing into this identity of somebody who does have friends and reaches out to, to them. Just so you know, like I put reminders in my phone to reach out to people because if I don't yeah. have those reminders, like I never <laughs> yep. reach out to them. It's like, man, am I just so self-centered and selfish that I never think about anybody? It's, no, it's just, that's just not how I'm wired. You know, Greg, right, you right. and I were, were talking about that before. Like Greg is the networker of our dynamic duo here. Um, I'm the person <laughs> who has to put reminders in, like reach out to Greg and ask him how his weekend went. <laughs> so otherwise I'm going to forget to yep. reach out to him at all. Yep. But yeah, shifting your identity um, is something that we talk about a good amount on this podcast. It's something that's near and dear to my heart as well. So let me ask you this because I'm curious to know, I think our listeners would benefit from hearing, what are you doing right now besides just the behaviors and and engaging in the behaviors and habits that your now new identity would behave in what do you do to keep those top of mind so that you don't still hold on to that old identity does that question make sense a little bit could you rephrase it one more time okay yeah so you're evolving out of this identity for 10 years you saw yourself as a bmx racer and now you're moving into an identity of somebody who is a real estate investor who's more focused on collaborations and networking and friendships. What do you do perhaps on a daily or weekly basis to ensure that you are propelling yourself towards the identity that you want to have now and not reverting back to the identity that you held previously? That's a really, really good question. It's something that pertains to these days right now. And one of the biggest things is exactly what you just said, remembering that you are and cannot do this alone. BMX was a very individual sport. Mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, a lot of me and my competitors, we had coaches, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a structured coach program, you know, coach athlete relationship for the most part. I had a really good coach athlete relationship with my coach, but at the end of the day, it's still a very individual sport. You know, it's definitely not a team sport. You're on the gate and on the track with eight other riders at any one time. And you are best friends with your friend next to you until that gate drops. And for the next 30 seconds, you are not his friend. Yeah. And so, and that goes, you know, and that went with anything. I mean, there wasn't, you know, there's no money in the sport, right? It's not something that you're doing for money. So you are responsible for all of your travel tickets, airfare, you know, everything. And so when I first got my four unit, when I got my first four unit in central California and I did that all by myself, took out a HELOC on my condo, went and drove Uber for a few years, you know, saved up. And when I got it and I did all the renovations, I did all the renovations myself, moved up there for six months, seven months, completed 85% of the work. I did hire on some contractors to a help me and teach me the things I did not know. Um, and then later on when I was getting burned out with the project, I just hired on someone to like, Hey, just finish it. I know how to do it, but like, I'm over it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so ending that I was still very, I guess, as a single minded individual where I'm like, Hey, I'm just going to do this all on my own. I'm going to save up buy the next one. It's going to take me a few years to save up. I'm cool with that. Live my life, whatever. And the way that the domino of effects went with how I got into multifamily, and really understanding how the game is played and like, man, you not only do you have to have other people, but well, I guess, and full stop there, you need other people and not only to be successful, but to be happy. And that kind of spilled over into the other parts of my life where it's like, yeah, you need other people in your life to not only have, you know, brain trust and encompassing of ideas and, you know, beliefs, but just to make progress and make forward progress. So to directly answer your question, that's probably the number one thing I remember is like you, I have, they're not reminders in my phone, but they're tasks <laughs> where, Hey, reach out to this person that you met, call them, ask them how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Cause that's very important. My therapist told me, Peter, you don't know how to make friends. You've yes. never put an importance <laughs> on it. Making friends requires that you call them once in a while and see how they're doing. <laughs> and so I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense, right? This is a, isn't that funny and, though? Because you're like, oh, this is common sense. But for us, this isn't common sense. Like, <laughs> 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 Right. Yeah. So I would probably say that, that that is actually the number one 
uh, thing to be top of mind in this new venture that I have undergoing. Mm -hmm. Everything else sort of blends over, you know, the discipline, the yeah. the mindsets, the challenges, how you overcome those challenges. And, you know, it's a lot of the the common sense things I had before of what's going to what's going to move the needle and what's going to get you going. So um, going back to that story, when you switched over from BMX to real estate investing, um, cause the two things that I wrote down about you was common sense and confidence, right? I think you mentioned both of those things a handful of times here. Did that confidence that you had from, uh, your BMX career directly transfer over and immediately transfer over to real estate investing? Or was there some fear of, man, I was really great in BMX real estate is like you said, more of a team sport. And I don't really know real estate as, you know, uh, as much well as, you know, BMX, was there any kind of fear when you were crossing over or were you just like, I'm confident I got this. It's a new arena, but you know, I'll just learn the rules and common sense will, will get me to that goal. I think more of the latter. Um, I will let you guys in on a little secret though, is not a secret, but when I was racing, um, I actually wasn't as confident as I probably put mm -hmm. myself out to be as far as I had that voice inside me that was saying like, you'll never make it because at first it was from where you were coming from you know, the, the tracks and the resources that we had weren't the best at the time. They are much better now, you know, like after I had left the facilities have increased tenfold in their, you know, in their ranking, but that was one of the things. And once I got past that little, once I got past that little voice in my head telling me that I was never going to make it all of this data that I was collecting and analyzing over the years kind of showed that like genetically, I just don't have the proper genetics that are needed for the sport. You know, I have a lot of slow twitch muscle fibers and you need a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers as one example. And that didn't really deter me at the time, because again, I was determined to make past that and make do with it. But as the years went on, it got more and more apparent, like, Hey, you might not have what it takes. Uh, but the biggest thing for me was being mentally present or lack thereof. And that was one of my biggest downfalls. And when I made the most progress was when I started to practice meditation and just be more present while, while I'm training on the track, et cetera. And so moving over to like the real estate, it, it wasn't so much that I didn't have that confidence. Um, but as I met more people, as I met more people and my circle expanded, and my mindset expanded and my abilities, or I guess my, that thought of like, holy cow, like I can do that. Mm -hmm. And, and all that expanded. Yeah. I wouldn't say it was, it was a lot of common sense of like, okay, this is what you need to do. And the, the long game or the, I guess, future trip in that a lot of newer people have going into the space, I really struggle with, you know, I really struggle with, Hey, I want to do the things now in order to, you know, prevent a future problem or to set me up for the right thing in the future. But again, you don't, you know, those future things they're they haven't happened yet. If they ever happen at all, you know, that's something that I really struggle with now. And the things, the discipline and the things that I learned in the sport of BMX, as far as, you know, it takes time took me 10 years to get my national ranking, took me, you know, and I'm also in sales in my my regular W-2 job. So that's another thing where, hey, maybe it'll take one or two years to close this deal. You don't know. So that really helped me. And I think I'm, I may be drifting off your question a little bit, but, you know, those sort of factors that I guess sports in general, that discipline that that teaches you, along with the common sense of, yeah, I'm here in real estate now. And in order to buy this $5 million building, I need investors and I need to market myself. And, you know, BMX was all self-marketing too, if you wanted to get sponsors and things like that. Um, yeah, just kind of all, you know, transferred over. Uh, but the same struggles that I had also transferred over as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I look at them as one in the same game. Right. Yeah. No, very well said. I know when I first started real estate investing, that was the first thing that actually really gave me confidence. So um, I didn't really have something to transfer that confidence into real estate investing. Like you said, it's kind of this interview is highlighting for me, you know, common sense. People think real estate investing is really complex and crazy and it can be, but for 99% of the people, um, it really is common sense, right? It's numbers yeah. and people and feel, and it's just all those things that you kind of put together. So I really love the way you, you package that common sense and confidence into real estate investing. And, um, yeah, your outlook is just superb for real estate investing. <laughs> I wish, I wish I had that 20 years ago, but I'm glad I have it now. And I'm glad you got it at an early age, man. 
Yeah. Like when I started to, you know, I didn't, I didn't read any of Kiyosaki's books until much, much later. I mean, it was after I would bought my first four unit and when I was well into my journey of syndication and multifamily where I was like, oh, everyone keeps talking about, you know, rich dad, poor dad and cash flow quadrant and this and that, like, oh, might as well, maybe I'll read them sometime, you know? And once I got <laughs> around to reading them, you know, I resonated a lot with what were in those books, but there were also things that I, 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 kind of always thought about or, uh, you know, agreed with, or I had those mentalities in my head all along. So it was, it was a lot of like what his teachings were, you know, about, you know, common sense and being like the difference between uh, the difference between facts and opinions, right? Like numbers don't lie. And, you know, it's common sense where like, ah, I, I can't iterate this enough, but you know, you pay rent, you never see that money again, you buy a house, buy a mortgage, uh, you know, there's more security in like cash flow versus a W2 job. I mean, all these things I, I already kind of resonated with. So it, uh, you know, I hate to overuse the word common sense, but that is literally what it was to me and still is to this day. Yeah, something that, again, I'll bring this up, it really stands out to me just listening to you tell your story is you strike me as somebody who has a great amount of psychological flexibility, right? So you're able to adapt and change and again, not hold on to who it was that you were. And so I bring that up because the question I want to ask is selfishly, I'm very interested, but I think our listeners will be interested to know too, like what's in the future for Peter? Like, where are you looking to go in the next three to five years? What, what do you see your future looking like? You know, Justin, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would have an answer ready to go. Like, no, it's, no, like that is common that sense. Is, have your three to five year plan, man. <laughs> that is the one that's a, well, that's a part of that identity shift from mm. racing till now is when I was racing, I guess I didn't really look past, you know, the age of 30 or 40. Like my whole thing was, as I was going to get to where I wanted to be, get all my titles, become a hometown hero, yada, yada, go back to my hometown, buy out my first bike shop that I worked at, yeah. run the bike shop, run the BMX track. Yeah. And who knows that still might happen, but moving over to this real estate thing, you know, a lot of, you know, like a lot of my mentors and a lot of my new coaches in the space, you know, they always ask me like, what's your why? You know, like, that's a very common question of like, Hey, what's your why? Why are you in this? And I'm just like, man, I don't know. Mm. And not only do I not know, I don't really want to spend time figuring it out because my first thing is take action, yeah. you know, like just do something. And if it's the wrong thing, great. It was the wrong thing, but at least you did something and then you can yeah. pivot and you learn something. Mm -hmm. And so people always ask me like, yeah, what's your three to five year plan? I mean, I had a lot of hobbies that took the back burner for many years because of racing. And so when I was getting out of that and quote, shifting identities, I started to pick up all those hobbies again. And I found like short-term enjoyment in all of them, but again, they weren't, they weren't passions. They weren't a lifestyle like racing was. And so I'm not putting a whole lot of emphasis or pressure on these, you know, these goals and these new identities and passions to emerge from itself. I want to say that this real estate thing is not so much of a stepping stone, but it's just keeping me busy while other things manifest. I have a lot of thoughts of like, Hey, maybe I'll be happy in a small house out in the countryside with a big garage with like 10 cars and some off-road toys. And I just <laughs> rip the mountains every day. And I have two dogs and I have a, you know, I, I have a wood barbecue pit in the back and I have a pizza oven because I love to cook, right? I have a little pizza oven inside, little hearth brick pizza oven. And then the other thing is, oh, maybe I want to live at the fast life, you know, live in the city, have a, you know, <laughs> rich house and, you know, a lot of girls and cars and just live in the fast life. Um, but I think to directly answer your question, a lot of the things that are emerging are, you know, the things that I think as human beings add a lot of value into our lives in the way of like helping people, you know, being there for people, um, the emotions that we feel, cause I'm a, I'm a very emotional person and I always preach like, Hey, I know the, I know the meaning of life. If you're confused, I'll tell you, you know, because the purpose of life, like the reason of life that we're the whole reason of why we're living on this planet is to feel emotions. You know, it's really the only thing that separates us from any other, you know, mammal out here is we have a full cognitive center. And not only can we feel the bad emotions, we can also feel the good emotions. And so if we constrain ourselves from feeling emotions, whether it's a heartbreak or, you know, we had a really bad event that happens in our life, trauma, not only can we numb the 
bad emotions, but we're also going to numb the, the good emotions. And it's a range, right? It's a full spectrum where it's, it's even to even. So if you only feel a little bit of the bad emotions, you're only going to feel a little bit of the good emotions. And, you know, the reason I say all this is to directly answer your question of, I think that my next, I guess, life goal is to experience and feel emotion, whatever that looks like, because now that I am interacting more with other human beings and I'm trying to develop these friendships and conversations and experiences, uh, that is something that, you know, to live life fully and presently is something that I've always struggled with. You know, I've never, I've never been fully present or it's always been really hard for me to be fully present because I'm always thinking about the next thing, or I'm always worried about, Hey, what do I need to do to get to where I want to be? And so I think that living a life that's present and full, whatever that means, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not chasing happiness. I'm chasing contentness. You know, I just want to be content with the trajectory, with where I'm going, with what I'm doing, And I, you know, I, I really do find that in a lot of the real estate investing that I, you know, that I come across where before it was, I also really struggled with workaholism. Uber was really good at making you into a workaholic because it wasn't really work. You were just driving. And sometimes I would drive for more than 24 hours straight, you know, and I'm, I'm a little ashamed to say that, but it did happen a few times. And so that numbed everything, Mm -hmm. you know, that numbed you didn't feel anything. I mean, and that's when I was really going through the identity shift and, you know, going through my first big breakup and all these, you know, things that just felt like the sky was falling on you. And if I could just go drive for 16 hours and just not feel anything, I was good. You know, I was good. That was my numbing drug. Right. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that's not a way that I want to live the rest of my life. And so not really necessarily slowing down, but just being more present. And, you know, the big thing with real estate is like, Hey, you need to be fully present and fully aware of what's going on and what you're talking about, who you're talking to, like, you need to be you to succeed. And the struggle of working, for example, and being a workaholic very quickly turned into like, Hey, no, it's actually I could now understand what that was taking away from me. And it wasn't just about the money. It actually wasn't about the money at all. You know, it was about who you became while you were working so hard that was going to prevent you from succeeding in this new venture that you're going on. So stop working so much. And I did, and it was great. And, you know, and so I think, you know, and, and with that being said, without working so much and not, not putting so much emphasis into that, I mean, how much time do you now have to, again, build relationships, be there with people, you know, do all these things that you put on the back burner for 10 years. That's been, that's been huge for me. But no, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I asked you what your, you know, big goal was for the next three to five years. And you mentioned that coaches are always trying to get you. What is your why? What is your big why? And so the next question that pops into my head, because I know my answer, and I think you and I might be wired pretty similarly is what is the biggest motivation for you right now when it comes to the real estate investment and learning more about what you're currently doing? Like what motivates you the most about that? Feeling emotions and time and experiences. You know, I got a lot of fulfillment in, so in the racing scene, I was a certified coach for a number of years, held my own clinics and was always you know, teaching the younger kids how to ride a bike, how to race a bike. And that was really fulfilling. Now that I'm out of that scene, I find myself getting caught up in what I'm doing. And again, going back to being the individual person that I am, I get caught up a lot with doing my own thing. And the little moments where I'm either helping somebody or it it could be as small as, you know, an old lady stopping you on the street and asking you for directions. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as that, that really puts you in your place of, why we're here on this earth to feel emotions, to help people. And to, you know, I feel that I have a unique, I I don't know if I would call it a gift or an ability, but because of who I am, and I guess my detachment to family and other people that I'm trying, that I'm evolving to become a lot more attached to, but I, I have a lot of time now that I can use to buy myself unlimited time in the future Mm -hmm. So that I can help and be there for the people that I care about in the future. And I'll have unlimited amount of time, you know, whether it's my, the people that I care about, I know that they're not going to be around forever. 
And if I can do something now to buy myself time in the future, I mean, I think that's ultimately what keeps me going in a lot of times where I feel, you know, down and out. And then the second thing would be the experiences. You know, I have the ability to give my friends, give people that I care about experiences that they may not get to ever experience otherwise. And I hold a lot of value in that because whether it's, you know, this reason or that reason, I was given the opportunity to work a lot. I was given the drive to, you know, become successful in whatever I want to become in. And I want to share that with other people. I want to help other people live the life that I want to live. And I think that that is, you know, again, kind of a blanket statement, but learning how to value friendships and how to value, you know, relationships just in general, that's kind of a big part of that. Whereas before, like, I didn't care. I didn't care to hang out with anybody. I didn't care to do things with anybody. Um, I was just so focused on what I wanted to do and focus on. And if you weren't even remotely involved in anything, like I, you know, I didn't, I didn't put any priority on, on you. And so now that I am sort of shifting these identities and all the things that we talked about, I think that's probably my biggest motivating factor is to not only buy my own time, but use that that time with other people that I care about and maybe help them and relate to them and the things that they're struggling with and relate to them in a way that they will understand and see. And that helps them to accomplish what they want to accomplish and overcome what they want to overcome. That sounds like a why to me. So I was going to say, that sounds like a, your great, greatest, <laughs> biggest picture why I've ever heard. So that yeah. was, that sounds like awesome a answer, decent Peter. why to me. <laughs> oh, I appreciate you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's, it's something that's very powerful to me where, and it, maybe this is my own experience, but, you know, and again, growing up heavily in the religious space, that's, you know, religion is one of those things where a lot of, you know, it's easy to forget relatability and it's easy to focus in on yourself and say, Hey, this is why I'm helping you so that I can feel like I've done my service or that I, you know, I can, I can feel more of a a good human being or whatever it is. And, you know, that may be a little bit brash to some of your listeners that, that are maybe very heavily in the religious space, but I have met, and actually I was at that time, one of those individuals where I would be either doing something or wanting to help somebody with the expectation that I would feel better or that I would get that, you know, return, I would get something in return out of it. And so it's kind of that mindset shift of, you know, take, for example, if someone says, Hey, I want to pray for you. And I say, well, I would get much more value if you said, Hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Or like, Mm -hmm. can I listen or can I help? Because I understand we're all humans and we all come from different walks of life. And what may be important to me and relates to me means nothing to the other human. And so it's not for me, it's not a matter of, you know, asking them like, hey, what do I think I need to do is more so listening in as to learn what they need me to do. And a lot of, you know, my biggest moments now in life are when I can put that into practice and not only listen to the people that I care about, but also find something in my own experiences and in my own life that is relatable enough so that when I start talking to them and I start responding to what they're telling me, that I can be a relatable person and say something that would actually help them instead of just, you know, spouting off on some generic advice or like, oh yeah, just, you know, don't worry about it and focus on the present and blah, blah, blah. (laughs) If I can say something that would actually help them and that I can, that I can see that actually makes an impact in either it's their life or, you know, maybe just in that moment, that's one of the most validating things I've ever felt. And, you know, being able to do more of that again, going back to time is that's, that's probably my biggest Yeah. My, my biggest motivator is the time to spend with those people to build those relationships so that I can be a catalyst to helping them get to either who they want to become or where they want to be, or just help them through whatever problem that they're having. And you can't do that if you're sitting in an office, so, you know, five days a week. Spoken like a true good coach. I love it, Peter. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think one more thing that popped into my head, it was, was flexibility. That was another thing that to me was just common sense from day one was flexibility. 
I mean, that to me was the most powerful thing. And maybe, you know, my mom, she, uh, she was a home health and hospice nurse for many years, which what I saw was flexibility. You know, she could say, Hey, I'm going to go and, you know, I'll go and see these other, these one or two patients now so that I can, you know, take you to your race later. Or, you know, she would always be shifting things around, shifting schedules and, and all of that. And I don't know how much that impacted my, my mindset on flexibility later on in life. But even before COVID started, like I would much rather take a few days working remote than I would with a pay raise, for example, because that flexibility, like the ability to just take 30 seconds to go do my laundry and then come back to work instead of having to, oh, Sunday's laundry day, right? Um, but the flexibility, cause I'm not a routine person. I don't have like a set daily or morning routine. It's just whatever goes, goes. And I am the most flexible when it comes to anything. And I see so much power and flexibility. So same thing with the time. If I have the flexibility, which real estate gives a lot of flexibility, I can meet everyone else's you know, schedules around my own. If someone needs, if something happens and someone needs me at this place and time, like I can be there. And that's just another thing. It just made common sense of, you know, why in, in a general world, you know, going to a nine to five job for five days a week doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In fact, it makes zero <laughs> sense in my opinion. And so I was always going after flexibility as well. And that's a, that's another pretty big why is to, I mean, I, I already have an extraordinary amount of flexibility, but, you know, to get even more flexibility is a very powerful thing in life. Yeah. So let's do a little bit of a pivot here. What are you currently working on that you'd like to share with the listeners, with our audience? Well, I'll speak, speak out of, I'll speak out of two sides of my mouth here, because one of the things that I teach other people and that I share from my own personal experience is analysis paralysis is the worst, most mm -hmm. detrimental thing. And the second that you feel yourself getting analysis paralysis, pick up the phone, call somebody, call somebody you trust, and they will help you through it, or they will help you just get out of your own head. Yeah. Right. And so what I'm currently working on, I've probably spent the last two or three months really learning how this game of multifamily and syndication is, is played by, by people that are more advanced and further along than me. And now I'm kind of applying my same concepts of what makes common sense to what I want to do for, for the future, which is a little bit hard, right? Because you asked like, what's my three to five year plan? And it was kind of an ambiguous answer. So that part is kind of hard of like, okay, well now I know how to, how everything works. How do I want to apply it for my own life? Yeah. And, you know, a big part of that comes, you know, that brings a lot of analysis paralysis where I'm like, shoot, okay, like just take action, move forward. Don't worry about trying to solve everything in the future. Um, and so, yeah, what I'm working on right now is, you know, focusing on just really learning how to work in this new environment that we're in, you know, the new environment with the, with the interest rates and just how the market's shifting so quickly and it's already shifted and just really focus on finding my next deal. Yeah. That's that's pretty much it. And where might our audience find you? Where's the best place if they want to get in touch with you? Probably the best place would be Instagram at Peter Eberhardt, you know, P-E-T-E-R-E-B-E-R-H-A-R-D -E 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 as in dog, T as in Tom. Probably the best place to get a hold of me. Man, how did you yeah, secure how did you secure that name without any dashes or anything in there? <laughs> <laughs> Do you join Instagram when it first started? <laughs> <laughs> maybe 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. I, uh, I, 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 you know, sometimes I get a little, um, little upset that my last name is so long and complicated, you know, I like simple is better. <laughs> and I've always wondered like, man, how could I, how could I, you know, change things to make it easier for people to find me? But, uh, no, nope, yeah. Peter Eberhardt. That's just one big, long, one big, long name that I'm proud to have. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll include that link in the show notes too. So if anybody wants to reach out to Peter, they can reach out by following that link in the show notes here. But I don't think your name's that long or complicated for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, Peter, um, you, yeah, you rose to the occasion. The, this has been a great interview. Yeah. You, you spoke philosophically, you spoke, you know, direct, yeah. like directionally right at us. So this has been a, a fantastic interview and um, yeah, really happy to have you on this uh, on this podcast, Peter. I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to be on here and share my story and looking forward to anything that comes in the future.
Yeah. Thanks again, Peter, for joining us. And thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in to the All In Mindset podcast, where we strive to improve your life and your mindset one podcast at a time. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Justin and I want to thank you for tuning into this episode of the All In Mindset podcast. We hope you found some valuable insights and inspirations from our conversation today. We'd love it if you would subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review on your favorite platform. If you have any questions or want to suggest a topic for future episodes, please feel free to reach out on social media or email us directly. Justin at all-inmindset.com or Greg at all-inmindset.com. Remember, you have the ability to achieve all your goals and create the life you want. It all starts with your mindset. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the All In Mindset Podcast.